Okay, today we have a hot topic called U equals U, and Dr. Julie Dombrowski is going to tell us sort of what the current thinking is about U equals U, and Julie is a very accomplished associate professor at the University of Washington. She, um, very early in her career, set out and immediately did a lot with uh, data to care and issues related to HIV linkage to care and the whole cascade of care and her work has really been recognized nationally. I know all of you have heard Julie speak before but we're really glad today to have her tell us more about U equals U. Thank you so much David and nice to see you all. I was here pretty recently for the CROI update so it's great to be here with you again. So I have my disclosures listed here. And I'm planning to talk about three aspects of U equals U today. First, I do want to review the science. Although there's a lot of it, there are three key studies that are important to understand underlying this message. Then I want to talk a bit about evolution of the slogan itself and its meanings, and then about counseling patients. And I'll tell you my view, but I'm certainly very interested to hear your experience and your suggestions as well. Okay, so the three key studies underlying the idea of undetectable equals untransmittable. First, and in many ways the flagship study of treatment as prevention was HPTN 052. And this study I'm sure many of you are familiar with, it stopped in, was published in 2016 and presented just before that. So this study randomized couples, serodiscordant couples, in which one partner was positive, one was negative, and it could be either gender, to either early antiretrovirals at a CD4 count of 350 to 550, or delayed antiretroviral initiation to wait until the CD4 count dropped under 250. The primary outcome was virologically linked partner infections. And you can see from this great graphic from the national curriculum that they enrolled 1,763 HIV serodiscordant couples the vast majority, importantly, in this study were male-female couples. 39 new infections occurred, and 11 of those were unlinked, 28 were linked, and of those, almost all of them were in the delayed arm, meaning they occurred when the positive partner was not yet on therapy. The one infection that occurred in the immediate arm was scrutinized pretty closely, as you can imagine, and seems to have very clearly occurred shortly after the person started antiretroviral therapy and was not yet virologically suppressed. So although this study found a 96% reduction in transmission with antiretrovirals, it supported the idea that undetectable, with undetectable viral load, there were no transmissions. Okay, so next, the partner study, which I would say for me personally was the one that really convinced me about this. This was an observational study, many more MSM in this study, 38% of the couples were MSM. Discordant couples followed over time, lots of questions about their sex, how they were having it, and got a lot of details of that and estimated 58,000 condomless sex acts. And really importantly, since this was a real world study, a lot of the men had STIs. So 17 or 18% of the MSM in this study had STIs during the time of follow-up. There were 11 new HIV infections, but none of them were linked. And they did a lot of statistical analysis to come up with an upper bound of the risk of transmission and clearly said the risk of transmission is zero with an upper bound of 0.3 per 100 couple years. Opposites Attract was presented just last year at IAS. This is an Australian study, hasn't been fully published yet, but this one just focuses on MSM, again, serodiscordant in Australia, Thailand, and Brazil. 358 couples with so far when it was presented, about, again, 17,000 condomless anal intercourse acts. Similar numbers of STIs, again, quite common in this population, just like in many of those we care for. And there were zero linked transmissions. So again, this really all, all, these are the three key studies supporting the idea that undetectable equals untransmittable. So how did this slogan evolve? I think part of what grabs people about this slogan so much is it is simple. U equals U is something people remember, and it really is a simple message that many people in the community and many of our patients can understand and have remembered. But certainly this is not a new idea. 2008, there was a lot of hubbub when the Swiss National AIDS Commission put out a statement to doctors in Switzerland essentially saying the same thing. So they were saying that if a patient is on antiretrovirals 
and is undetectable, they do not have a risk of transmitting to sexual partners. That was driven mostly by legal concerns since there were issues around people being prosecuted or concerned for that for transmission. And it was actually the legal concerns that drove them to put out this statement. But there was, it went like wildfire all around the world and a lot of people challenged it and felt that it was a dangerous statement at the time. Vancouver, BC really also grabbed onto this message early and they started a campaign called the Stop Campaign before the 052 results even came out. And that was really about getting everybody in Vancouver, BC on antiretroviral therapy, both for purposes of individual health as well as preventing transmission. HPTN 052 was stopped early in that year. And in 2012, the US treatment guidelines changed to recommend ART for all persons living with HIV. And in that statement, when that recommendation was changed, the committee cited 052 and the prevention of transmission as part of the reason for that. 2014 was that partner study, the real world one, lots of MSM, lots of STIs, that that was presented. And it was just in 2016 that a group called the Prevention Access Campaign really came up with this U equals U slogan and started to promote that. In 2017, as I mentioned, was that Australian study. And also last year, I would say, is when many, many organizations, state and city health departments began to officially sign on to this statement. So there is a consensus statement about U equals U that's available on the Prevention Access Campaign website that describes what they mean and why this was put out. And it now has over 600 signatories from various organizations and 75 countries. So most state health departments in the US have sort of officially signed on to this as well as cities and CDC and NIH as well have signed on. CDC wrote a Dear Colleague letter, I believe it was last year as well, supporting this statement. So over that time period, I would say that the community has certainly become more aware of this as well, that it didn't just start in 2016 when the U equals U slogan came out. So this is one indication of this. This is admittedly a select population. It is MSM who are attending the Pride Parade in Seattle, so certainly not representative of everybody. But we've asked this question for a number of years now reformatted it, but the way it was worded is up there. Do you think HIV positive people who take medicine to treat HIV are less likely to give HIV to their sex partners? And as you can see, people who have been diagnosed with HIV, those men were more aware of it and it has increased over that time. But in parallel, knowledge about that has increased among HIV negatives as well. Still not the majority in that group, but probably getting close. Another trend over that same time that I think is really relevant when we think about how we are talking to our patients about U equals U and what it means are the STI trends. I'm showing you here data from, again, Public Health Seattle King County, but these are mirrored in many, certainly large cities in the US. So the key public health clinical success that you can see is HIV going down 37% over that time. In 2017, we just had 122 new diagnoses of HIV among MSM. We really are seeing a true and substantial drop in HIV. And at the same time, and for good reasons, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia have gone up really substantially. The reason I focused here on urethral gonorrhea and chlamydia is because those are symptomatic infections. And when we look at all STIs going up, there's often an issue about PrEP and whether that leads to ascertainment bias. In other words, men who are on PrEP are getting more frequent STI screening, and so we find more STIs. But this is looking at STIs that we would have presumably found and diagnosed uh, regardless of screening. Up, up, up. So how do we talk about this with our patients? I think that, to me, this is the most important part about U equals U is really that it does combat stigma. This means a lot to community groups and to patients. You can see some of the examples of campaigns here from US and from other countries. And I have had the experience with talking in particular with patients who aren't necessarily tied into the gay community in Seattle, who've had very emotional responses to this. One woman just last week when we were talking about this, she is a woman from Sub-Saharan Africa. She hasn't been in a relationship for years, but has met someone and is thinking about 
starting a sexual relationship. And when I talked to her about this, she actually got tears in her eyes and started shaking. I think she was so relieved to hear this. And that, to me, is the most powerful part about U equals U. So how do we counsel patients? Well, first, I do think that it's important to recognize that, especially for those of us who've been working in HIV prevention for a long time, this is a huge change in messaging. Right? For a long time, the message was that condoms were the only certain way of preventing HIV when people were having serodiscordant sex. And it's important to remember, sometimes I hear lower lower efficacy quotes, but being generous, even condoms and consistent condom use is 90 to 95 percent effective, right? So having an undetectable viral load is even more effective than that. But it's a big change in messaging. I think some providers have been uncomfortable with this, and some patients and community members, I think, have been uncomfortable with this as well. We, as Healthcare providers and public health officials sometimes tend to really focus on the caveats. I think initially the caveats were we don't have enough data in MSM and STIs could change this. We now know that's not the case. The biggest caveat now, I think, is, is the positive partner truly undetectable, taking their medications consistently? And that is an important caveat, but it, I think it's important not to let, you know, to talk about that, but not to let the caveats override the key message of U equals U. I do think clear messages are important. So you can see here the U equals U consensus statement did say a negligible risk and clarified that negligible to them means so small or unimportant as to be not worth considering. And there's been a lot of discussion around that word and how it said. CDC, you can imagine the conversations that must have gone into clearing this statement, and they did say someone with an undetectable viral load have effectively no risk of transmitting the virus. So those are the words those organizations have chosen to qualify with. There are also, as you can see here, some examples of language that people use. I think it's important to think about this as we counsel our own patients. Do we say you can't transmit? Do we say it is no risk or effectively no risk or don't transmit? You can see some examples of uh, how that language has been used. So I'll tell you my view on counseling patients, and I'm really interested to hear from others of you. So first, I think patients clearly deserve to know this information. For the most part, the community is aware, but not everybody is, and it is important and it is science-based. So I do think that patients need to know this information. As I mentioned, and with that anecdote about my patient, I think that knowing about this can make a big difference in how people feel about themselves and their internalized stigma, as well as combating stigma within the community. So when I'm counseling my patients, I've chosen to use the word don't rather than can't because can't to me implies it could never happen where don't implies to me it doesn't happen. And we know that from studies that we went over. So I do give the message that people with undetectable viral loads don't transmit HIV. I think that's an accurate statement. And I talk to patients about how there are really three key things to consider in preventing HIV transmission. There's the positive person being virally suppressed, there's a negative person being on PrEP, and condoms. And really, you have to decide with your partners what is the right mix of those three. Some people are comfortable with having the positive partner undetectable on consistent antiretrovirals and not using condoms and not having the negative partner be on PrEP. For other people, especially those who've lived with HIV for decades, that can still be uncomfortable and they aren't able to relax and have sex with just depending on the positive partner being undetectable. And so they decide to often have the negative partner on PrEP or use condoms with some partners. But then this is to me the key sort of caveat. It doesn't diminish U equals U, but I think the key things to remember first are you need to make sure that you stay undetectable. That's key, obviously, for individual health and a common message. But if you don't use condoms, you're not preventing STDs. So you're preventing HIV transmission, but you're still at risk for STDs. STDs are rising, and you really need to get screened every three months and come in quickly if you have symptoms. And I usually take the opportunity when I have the time to briefly educate patients about the symptoms of syphilis. If you have a sore genitals, rectum, or mouth, come in right away. If you have a rash, even if you're not sure what it is, come in right away. And that's the way I give this message.